Welcome to Virtual Zoo Tours, the channel that takes you on a virtual trip to the zoo. And if you haven't already, I really recommend that you go ahead and hit those like, sub, and bell icons to officially join the Virtual Zoo. Greetings everyone from the most magical place around, where wonder meets the wild. Yes, welcome to the channel's debut of Disney's Animal Kingdom. Originally proposed in 1989 as Walt Disney's very own zoological theme park, Animal Kingdom opened a mere 10 years later on Earth Day in 1998 as a tribute to wildlife from around the globe. Not only is this the largest of Disney's theme parks, but it's set apart by its naturally themed environment and over 2,000 species of live animals and plants. Through our tours, we'll safari on the open plains of the African savanna through the Harambe Wildlife Reserve. We'll trek in the dense vegetation of the Gorilla Falls Exploration Trail, and we'll marvel at the craft and beauty of the Maharaja Jungle Trek in the Jewels of Asia. But it all kicks off with the Oasis and Discovery Island, first off the former of the two. Though I don't know exactly when it opened, the Oasis is basically the equivalent of Magic Kingdom's Main Street USA. This lush, and I mean lush, tropical paradise contains lots of foliage, peaceful waterfalls, many rare and intriguing forest inhabitants, and honestly, it just offers a well-needed break from the crowds. On the other hand, Discovery Island essentially serves as the main hub of the park, connecting to each of the sections via bridges over the Discovery River, though it has a slightly different backstory. Originally called the Tree of Life Gardens, and if you don't know why, you'll find out soon, but its residents were instead chosen for their unique shapes, forms, and colors in order to show off species diversity here on Earth. And with that, let's begin. Just outside the main gate, where once your bag of literally just camera equipment is rummaged through, you'll eventually reach the ticket area. Past this, we'll enter the Oasis. Tucked underneath a dense canopy and located front and center, the first thing you'd see as you enter the park is this little peaceful pond. In here I spotted multiple different species of waterfowl, but the stars were their roseate and African spoonbills. The roseates typically having more of a pinkish coloring, which like flamingos, comes from the carotenoid pigments that they eat, compared to their white and lighter colored African counterparts who feed primarily on fish, crustaceans, insects, mollusks, and amphibians. I guess proving once and for all that many things can in fact be eaten with spoons just as well as any other utensil. To the right of them, and onto one of Animal Kingdom's main paths, oh yeah also past this weird tree lady, is another small but unsigned pond. Continuing onward, and this time tucked away in a secluded corner off to the left, is a small island for the Southeast Asian native Reefs Munjak also known as the Barking Deer, but since this little guy wasn't really having it on my visit, we'll be moving on. No need to worry though, because we'll be seeing them again very shortly. Located directly across from the deer, in another but larger forested paddock, is another hoofed mammal, aka the channel's debut of the Babarusa. Baba what now? The Babarusa, sometimes known as a deer pig, is a hog a part of the swine family that is found in the jungles of Indonesia, particularly the islands of Sulawesi, Tolgan, Sula, and Beru. They're most commonly known for their prehistoric-like appearance, which is largely due to the prominent upwards and curving canine tusks that can be found on male specimens. Though it's still unknown what exactly these tusks are used for, speculation has concluded that they're either used in fights over breeding rights, or they simply protect the pig's face and eyes from injuries. But these antler-like canines can come at a pretty hefty cost for those who sport them. There are reports of a male Babarusa's tusks actually growing so far back that they pierce into the skin and head of the animals, causing injury or even death. Luckily for males in captivity, like Mentari here, they don't really have to worry about this, as their tusks are trimmed regularly.
Neighboring them and heading deeper into the center of the oasis, where the light barely touches the forest floor, is another small rocky outcrop home to the rhinoceros iguana. These guys get their name from the horn-like protrusions on a male's snout, which just happen to resemble that of a rhino's horn. These horns, as well as noticeable femoral pores located on their thighs, are used to release pheromones during breeding season in order to attract a mate. Coming in at 24 to 54 inches, they're quite large for a lizard, if only their population back in the Caribbean was just as big. Though they are currently listed as endangered, good news is that grants them protection by the local governments. On the other side of the path, the peaceful serenity of this set of waterfalls is constantly being broken by more noisy waterfowl residing in this large pond. In here, you'll spot the rosy-billed pochard, the chilo widgeon, some unsigned redheads, and the most popular of the bunch, a breeding pair of black-necked swans, who are on another note, the largest species of swan in South America. Now I honestly didn't even notice this till like my sixth time through, but also in the same area of the main pond, tucked away in a corner, is another small moated space containing multiple skittish wallabies. Now when you think of wallabies, you probably think of deserts in open spaces, and honestly, I don't blame you. But did you know that unlike their much larger relatives, the kangaroos, these guys can actually inhabit the dense forests and rocky hillsides of Australia? Moving on from the marsupials and back onto one of the main paths, this time to the left, is one of the larger areas of the oasis. This multi-leveled and well-shaded yard is home to the parks, sovereign giant anteaters, and if they don't catch your attention as you stroll by, then I don't know what will. The sovereign giant anteater is the largest of four living subspecies and can be found foraging the forests and grasslands of Central and South America for, as their name suggests, ants as well as termites. They'll actually use their large foreclaws to dig up insect nests and then use their long, and I mean up to two foot long, sticky tongues which are actually covered in small spiny protrusions to slurp up a meal. As can be seen here, their bushy tails seem to make great comforters, and they're actually known to use them to cuddle up when sleeping. Guess it's nap time now for them, but no worries, there's still more to see. Heading back to the inner trail, and just behind this thick row of vegetation, is a small wooden swinging bridge. After a rather shaky crossing, you'll enter a large cave area right in front of multiple waterfalls along the back side of the pond, which is still viewable through tiny peepholes in the rock. Proceeding towards the light and emerging from the tunnel, we'll finally get a good taste at the good old Disney crowds. Ahead of us, a large bridge passing over what's known as the Discovery River, and in the distance, well, I'll just save that for later. Across the bridge, and after a very, very, very long walk, we'll eventually reach the park's main plaza, originally referred to as Safari Village, littered with so much more than your average themed merchandise shops and restaurants with very overpriced bottles of water, each of which having its own story to tell. But front and center, it's almost impossible to miss the famous Tree of Life. Truly a sight to behold, at 145 feet tall, not only does it tower over the park, but it's viewable from almost everywhere you stand. The tree was inspired by a mythological concept connecting all forms of life to this sacred plant, truly the giver of life. Built to resemble a large baobab tree, it contains around 8,000 different branches, varying in size and shape, and around 102,000 individual thermoplastic leaves. Looking closely, you'll notice a mere 325 hand-carved animals scattered both on and around the tree's premises. 
tucked inside of the tree's trunk is the feeder for the It's Tough to Be a Bug show, because you know, bugs also live in trees. But as if this isn't it, located directly in front of the tree is a large grassy area home to a pretty large mix of its own, the red kangaroo, the largest marsupial and also the largest terrestrial mammal of Australia, the white stork, my personal favorite of the bunch, and honestly, the only one who was somewhat cooperative with the cameras, as well as a pair of lapid faced vultures hanging out by their very own nest, though I'm not really sure how they get along with the rest because they are among the most aggressive birds in Africa. The only ones missing would be the East African crowned cranes that are supposedly, keyword, supposedly still exhibited with the others. Looking left and a few steps away from this, we'll come across a small viewing shelter. From here, we can look out over a modest sized pond placed in front of what we just saw. Living here is a flock of lesser flamingos, but don't let the lesser in their name turn you away as they are among the most abundant and widespread flamingos across the globe. Around the corner and just off the main path headed to Africa is a small one-off exhibit dubbed the Otter Grotto. How is it a grotto? I do not know, though apparently it was renovated sometime in 2019. It can be viewed off to the far left, as well as overlooked from a much higher vantage point on the right, though undoubtedly the greatest view lies within this shaded cave-like area. Here the animals can be viewed from both above and below the water surface through a series of glass panels as they glide by with ease. I'm talking about no other than the Asian small clawed otters, based on experience, one of the fan favorites here in Discovery Island. Their name, small clawed, refers to their small claws compared to other otters that do not extend beyond the pads of their webbed feet. Disney is currently home to a family of five, including mom, dad, and three triplets, all of which were born right here at Animal Kingdom. The trail then cuts off of the main path and heads back towards the center of the tree. Tucked away behind an ice cream cart and near another small bridge is a large and heavily overlooked 4-5 to five foot deep pool containing the Perun Shark Catfish, a large species of freshwater catfish from the Chao Phraya and Mekong River basins in Indochina that just happens to have a sizable trailing dorsal fin resembling that of a shark. This I believe is an individual named Bruce, one of the largest of his kind in US captivity, though that's nothing to the approximate 10 feet and 660 pounds some of these catfish can grow to. Sadly, the Perun shark is currently listed as critically endangered in its native range due to overfishing, river damming, and pollution. Now some of you may be thinking, so what, it's just the catfish. But the truth is, this might be the last time we ever see this iconic species again on these tours. Now this is where it gets a bit confusing. And by the way, for this reason, I left a map of our path down in the description for you all to follow along. So you can either get back on the main path and follow the flow of adventurers to Africa, or like us, you can head deeper into the center of the island, near the tree's roots. After a lot of winding and very confusing paths, and past this look at the backside of the kangaroo exhibit, you'll eventually find a small island back near the main plaza area. I guess one could kinda say that this is representing the island of Madagascar because of the frolicking lemurs just about everywhere. I had the pleasure of spotting the ring-tailed lemur, though the more common of the two, but still a treat to see, and the collared brown lemur, one of the only co-dominant lemur species, meaning that there is no clear gender-based hierarchy in their groups. But we're not quite finished here just yet. Back onto one of the park's main paths, this time the one to the right, we'll follow it all the way down past the entrance to It's Tough to be a Bug and the bridge to Asia, near the very backside of the tree. What you're looking at is actually the exit to the show, 
and that's probably why not many people even know there's stuff back here. Continuing on, through this seemingly never-ending mess of routes, and past multiple waterfalls that, by the way, allow for some pretty good photo shoots, we'll continue to get great views of the tree and its entirety. When the path finally opens back up, we'll see our final set of stops. First, crawling within the tree's roots was the Galapagos Giant Tortoise. For those of you who didn't know, they are the largest living species of tortoise, and by far. And though these youngsters might not quite live up to that name right now, it's alright because they've still got over a hundred years to reach their maximum size. Adjacent to this was an empty exhibit, and it looks like I just missed their family of Cape Porcupines. And at last, closing out our journey is a small meshed enclosure attracting a lot of attention, home to the cotton-topped tamarind, a small monkey weighing in at less than 1.1 pounds, and easily recognizable by their long, white, sagittal crest on their forehead. And that concludes this extensive tour and our first look at Disney's Animal Kingdom through not one, but two of the most overlooked and underrated zoo exhibits out there. This is where I'll leave you for now, but next time we're back in the land of magic, we'll cross the bridge in order to explore a whole other world as we safari through the plains, forests, and rivers of the Harambe Wildlife Reserve. Till then, stay tuned, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time on Virtual Zoo Tours.